It is a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Vadia Selvin, all the way from Old Bridge, New Jersey, United States. Dr. Selvin has had an innate and deep-seated passion for science and the nature around him since first grade. Dr. Selvin has had a long journey in dentistry since graduating from dental school in India back in 1988 with a BDS degree. He was selected for an orthodontic postdoctoral program in Wisconsin, but he couldn't pursue it for financial reasons. He went on to completing the advanced standing course at NYU, attaining his DDS degree in 1992. Due to his keen interest in hospital dentistry, he proceeded to complete a hospital-based residency program at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York City in 1993, where he was exposed to anesthesiology, oral surgery, TMJ, and OR surgeries and protocols. From there, he worked in and around Philadelphia as a general dentist in various dental practices for six years. Armed with this experience and the arsenal of clinical and administrative and business skills, he decided to open his own private practice in New Jersey, where he practices to this day. He is the current president of the New Jersey chapter of the Academy of General Dentistry and was recognized through an award for lifelong service and recognition by the Academy of General Dentistry in Boston in July 2016. He was also awarded his fellowship and mastership through the Academy of General Dentistry. He also has a fellowship with the International College of Oral Implantologists. He is a very hardworking, dedicated, passionate, caring, and a talented dentist with an eye for detail and a spirit for perfection in everything he does. He is also an artist with a burning desire and passion for art and has a large portfolio of paintings, sketches, and photographs. Part of his portfolio is seen on his website, www.drsel-vandds.com. His taste for art started back when he was young and started to hold a pencil. He had won numerous drawing and painting competitions, participating in college, soap carving, collages, soap carving, essay writing, etc., to name a few. While growing up, he also developed a keen eye for photography in terms of lighting, composure, and shadows. He also does sculpting with clay and paper pulp. The other hobbies he pursues with a passion, including traveling, reading, tasting different food, astronomy, and gardening. He is an avid nature lover. Dr. Selvin believes in the power of passion, persistence, and perseverance. We can achieve the pinnacle of our dreams with strict discipline and motivation by following these and what he says. Congratulations on getting the lifelong service recognition by the Academy of General Dentistry. That is just unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man, what a distinguished career. Thank you so much for being on my show today. And it's Thank a special you. show because it's, um, what number is this, Ryan? It's going to be number 533, and it is Ryan's one-year anniversary working with his old man. After he graduated from college, he uh, thought my show was uh, uh, pretty amateur, and he decided to help his old man out. And uh, and uh, thank you for one year, Ryan. That, that is amazing. So, Congratulations, uh, Ryan. Yep. So how are you doing today, Dr. Selvin? Good, sir. Perfect. Thank you. So what? So two months ago, we just had 6,000 Americans graduate from 56 dental schools. Uh, exactly. what, what advice would you give these kids that just walked out of school? You know, in today's world, uh, dentistry has become as business and, uh, you know, we are not taught the business aspect of things while we are in dental school. And I would sincerely suggest the students who are coming out of school to, you know, know the business aspect of it before they pursue different path. You know, there are different paths of residency. You can be an associate with a large corporate dentist, dentistry practice. You can uh, join the army or the Air Force or the Navy. And, you know, there's a lot, a lot of other modalities by which, um, you know, you can pursue your career, but you need to know the business aspect of it before you jump into private practice setting. Do you think the dental schools prepare these kids for the business knowledge when they graduate from dental school? I don't think so. Probably they'll have one or two courses uh, as a precise, concise uh, MBA, like a summary sort of, but it's not actually preparing them for the real life to run a practice or, you know, run the business aspect of things. You know, I see the same thing in dental schools and high schools. You know, these kids tell their teachers a thousand times they hate geometry, they hate algebra, they hate all this stuff, and then they graduate from high school and they can't even balance their checkbook from Bank of America. Right. That's it's, right. It's like they're so long on skills they're never going to use, and they're so short on real-world reality. I mean, you graduate from dental school, if you open up your practice, when payroll was due at the end of the week, they wouldn't even know how to do basic payroll. 
Exactly. Yep. You're relying on the payroll companies, and you know that's how it works. So, so what do you? So, what did? How do these kids learn uh, the business of uh, dentistry? Yeah, uh, you know, hands-on approach is the best for me personally. Uh, residency uh, was an intermediary stuff where I was supposed to, you know, I could learn a lot of things which is applicable in a private setting, and also my exposure to uh, by working with various private practices in and around Philadelphia, I was able to gather uh, a lot of information and, you know, it was hands-on training, you know, we made our mistakes and we learned from them. You know, uh, these kids that work for corporate dentistry, I mean, you know, the the average dentist has their own office and they work for like, say, Heartland with 1,500 offices or Pacific Dental with 500 offices. And at the end of the first year, you ask these kids any business question like, well, what's the, what's the insurance code for, uh, three surface MOD filling. They don't know. Uh, that, yep. that, the dental office you work for, what did it produce and what what was the adjusted production? What was the collection? They don't know. You yep. say, well, what was their overhead? I mean, they had all these opportunities to be going to lunch with the office manager, the regional manager, the national manager. I mean, they could have walked out of one year working at, um, at Heartland and had literally an MBA degree. And exactly. after one year, they, they didn't. Uh, so, yeah. So you recommend that they go work for someone and learn the business? Yeah, yeah. always a hands-on training is the best. And um, in my view, like you said, uh, you know, they are meeting with all the clients and, uh, you know, they are in t- uh, touch with the administrators on a daily basis, going to lunch with them. You know, you can br- open up a conversation and learn things from them, which you can read by, you know, reading on the internet or the books or podcasts or whatever. So it's a hands-on approach is what I would uh, prefer or have a mentor. Uh, from whom you can learn hands-on, you know, whom you can trust and you learn from their experiences and talk to other colleagues at dental meetings and, you know, you go to dental meetings, most of the people you don't see, talk to their neighbors or whatever, everybody's busy with their smartphones and iPads. So that's the time to capture uh, knowledge from your colleagues who are wet-fingered and hands-on in their own private practices. So you learn a lot from their personal experiences and approach to the clinical field of dentistry. You know, I, I trace my steps back and, and uh, look at, you know, what, what really helped me the most when I got out of school. I still think the defining moment for me was joining the Academy of General Dentistry and um, setting out the goal to get my FAGD like you got, a fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry, and then go on to get my mastership because not only was it filling your head with so much knowledge, but when you would go to those courses, it was the same people. And these now became your friends. And, you know, you always say audit your friends, get rid of the toxic, get rid of the Debbie Downers, get rid of people who are draining energy. And the next yep. thing you know, you had all these friends that were cheering you on and pushing you. And, and what, 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 how, explain the journey for you of joining the Academy of General Dentistry. You know, it has been a long journey since 1993. I've been a member and, uh, you know, you know, I traveled to a lot of courses. Um, which uh, most people whom I had come in contact with, uh, you know, they said it's just a waste of money and, uh, you know, you're wasting your time, you could, uh, you're losing production. You know, in my view, it's like you come out of dental school uh, and you just know the theoretical aspect of things. And if you don't know the hands-on approach of dentistry, you know, that this is where you learn from continuing education. And also all the dentists uh, who are attending these courses, most of them, uh, they are in private practice. They have hands-on approach to different uh, types and different scenarios of treatment planning and also the type of treatment complications, you know, all those things. So basically, you learn from these people who are your colleagues and you're sitting next to them shoulder to shoulder and you can ask them questions, make, make turn left or turn right and you get, you get the answer at an instant instead of, uh, you know, reading through thousands of pages or thousands of journal, research journals or whatever. What would you say to a kid who just walked out of school and says, I don't have any money to join the American Dental Association, the AGD, because I have $350,000 of student loans. What would you say to that kid? Okay, so in my view, you know, mind has to be kept open. And school basically gives us a base infrastructure or a baseline. So we need to develop from that foundation what we have learned in school. You know, it's not be all and all. So the, the thing is, uh, you know, you have to keep up your, keep your minds open and basically learn from 
you know the textbooks or you know textbooks is not the only thing you, you read journals you update yourself attending these agd courses and if you don't have money you're actually that's a complaint in my view because you're losing an asset which is your knowledge you know if you don't update your knowledge you sink and keeping up uh, with the current technology and the current knowledge uh, you know things change uh, equipment changes the supplies daily dental supplies change uh, you know, and the technology changes in general. So if you don't update ourselves with current technology, we're basically it's a sink or uh, swim situation. You know, they they come out and they say, you know, that they they they've had this common complaint graduating from dental school from every country on earth since the beginning of time that they you know that they didn't learn enough. Um, and I I think the schools are miracle workers that they can take 100 kids off the street and then in four years turn them loose with a license. But they're, they're yep. going to say, okay, I didn't learn how to place an implant. I didn't learn CAD CAM. I didn't learn sleep apnea, snore. I didn't learn ortho, short-term ortho, Invisalign. There's so many things. What, what, what do you think they should learn first, second, third, fourth? What, what's a return on investment? Um, you know, they, um, there's so many institutes, like, like take TMD, TMJ. I mean, there's so many institutes that are so much money and, and give them guidance because we're on a podcast and you and I are in our 50s and the, the data on podcasts is they're all under 30. So we're talking to millennials. We're not talking to yep. um, a bunch of grandpas like us. We're talking exactly. to kids. Um, so, so all these things they didn't learn. What do you, if they join the AGD yes. and there's all these things. What, what do you think, what order should they learn? What would be a return on investment? What would help them grow their practice or business and help them pay off their student loans? See, AGD stands for quality continuing education. So I basically concentrated myself into learning different disciplines within the field of dentistry, which keeps changing every day. So until I keep myself up to date by taking courses, you know, I'm losing a paddle basically. So, you know, say you're in a small demographic society and you have a small practice in that society. Based on what, uh, you know, you're telling me about a lot of dental schools and a lot of dental students coming out every year. So in that particular demographic society, you're basically a tiny practice and which has competition every year based on the number of students who are coming out. So we need to be one step ahead of the crowd if we need to survive. And everybody is today is an insurance based business system. And it's not a comp when compared to retail stores, you know, they can have multiple stores within different geographic locations and they make money in one store. They make my they make money in the other stores. So, you know, they lose one, they gain one. So overall, their bottom line is to answer to the shareholders and a bottom line is profit in their terms. In our case, it's a insurance-based system. It's not a fee-for-service based system how it used to be prior to say 30 years back, where the the previous dentist generation of dentists they really enjoyed uh, and got a reward for what they did. So today, based on the insurance-based system, you have to be up to date and current. So losing money on, or I would say, investing money on certain CE courses which you like and which you can apply what you learned in the practice based on what you learned from the CE courses it, where I would bet my money on. And uh, you know, you have to, because you're basically competing with your uh, next door dentist or your next door uh, physician who are, is, you know, and basically you're building a rapport. So, you know, the more knowledge you have and how you stand out from the crowd is what makes the difference. In, in life, if you just follow the crowd, you're part of the, you know, part of the crowd. But if you create your own path and, uh, you know, stand out uh, based on your credentials and your expertise, you know, you will come out way ahead. So which one of these, um, so you made a point that, um, you know, dentistry in our, in our lifetime has gone from fee for service, where you just submit your fee and insurance pays a percent. So now yep. 82% of the 211,000 dentists alive in America with an active dental license, 82% take a PPO where they submit you the fee, and the fees are 40% lower uh, than back in the day. Um, what, so because of the insurance situation in America, uh, which one of these things do you think are profitable? Implants, CAD cam, sleep apnea, snore, ortho, TMD, 
Does, does any of that, um, or what, what things interest you in this insurance driven market? In my view, looking at uh, what is profitable, that is a business approach. But it's how we handle what we are comfortable with. You know, you don't want to just start an implant system or an implant procedure because your next door neighbor is doing it. You should be comfortable with what we are doing and we should be comfortable hands-on wise and on a, the whole team has to be in sync with what you're doing. If you're doing an implant and the front desk is not, uh, the your assistant is not uh, up to par with the procedures of the dental procedures and the armamentarium associated with it, then um, you know you're going to spend more time spending on um, you know training the associate or the uh, assistant in uh, proceeding with doing the dental treatment. So you have to be comfortable. You know you be comfortable with who you are and what you're comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with certain procedures and you end up with a complication, you know you're, you're by yourself. I mean you don't have a helping hand outside your practice. You know you're the master of your you know you're master of your ship basically. So you have to be comfortable with what you do, and based on that, uh, you know, do do what you're comfortable with, and then proceed with that. But just because the next person is doing it, uh, you know, if you're not comfortable, just refer the patient to an oral surgeon or a periodontist who is well versed in placing the implants, and you do the restorative portion. But always form a team. Sometimes there are instances where you send a patient out to a periodontist or an oral surgeon, and the patient never comes back to you. And because they have already hired a general dentist in their uh, own private practice, so you know, bottom line is, you know, be be comfortable with what you do. Now you're in Old Bridge, New Jersey. Is that a suburb of Philly, or is that a small rural town? It's uh, it's based in uh, Central New Jersey, uh, close to East Brunswick. So you know, we have a pretty good uh, residential community around us. But at the same time, I see a lot of growth in the last. Uh, what uh, 19 years I'm here uh, with all the amount of uh, dentists to opening up uh, shops next door and uh, you see a lot of competition within the uh, small uh, demographic area and uh, this is what is happening across the country and you know cities are crowded and saturated but the remote part of the Midwest and uh, you know it's uh, you know they don't have much dentists who want to go there because of the cost of I mean the reimbursements and you know all those whatnot and the lifestyle. And, you know, um, I've lectured in four continents in the last four months, and some countries like Brazil, most yeah. experts in Brazil say they have exactly twice as many dentists, and that half the dentists in Brazil are not even going to be able to make a living in dentistry. Um, India has had a explosion of private dental schools. Uh, exactly. Malaysia went from one dental school to six in yeah. 10 years. Um do you think that the the, the um, addition of extra dental schools in the United States is unnecessary and unwarranted and will hurt the uh, economics of dentistry? I think it would, if unless uh, you know dentists uh, follow a fee for service model, which is quite unlikely based on the scenario what the insurance companies are handling. Um, so I, I I think that's highly unlikely that it's going to change. But unless we group together or uh, you know the but Danish decide to follow a group uh, fee for service practice. You know this this is the trend we, which we are looking at, and there's going to be tough competition. And uh, you know, opening up dental school is not the solution. Dental school has become a business. You know, like it or not. So you know, it is a business. So they are running their business, and we have to run our own. And we have to make a decision what we want to do, and what is good for us under our terms. The dental schools are a business now. That is so true. I mean, most of these private dental schools say that every time they raise their tuition $10,000 a year per student, they have no decrease in the number of applicants. So that's why there's basically a race to $100,000 a year for everyone because uh, they can get it. So are, so what type of dentistry are you? Are you PPO, like four out of five dentists? Are you fee-for-service? What are you doing? No, I've been a... PPO based dentist for the last uh, I would say about uh, 18 years and since uh, past December uh, I had uh, a lot of network on most of the plans so I've decided to concentrate more on quality than quantity and spend uh, my expertise on what I know and uh, what I want to do under my terms. So you're decreasing your insurance driven PPO practice and headed towards more fee-for-service? Yes, 
I'm, I'm concentrating more on quality versus quantity, which, you know, based on the uh, competition which you see around us, you know, you have to stand out from the crowd like we talked about and you concentrate and, you know, I know all my patients uh, personally and their families. So, you know what, my practice is primarily based on um, word of mouth and, you know, I, I like that better than, uh, you know, someone coming off a list from an insurance carrier. So, so let's go back, uh, say, five, let's, it's 2016 right now. Let, let's go back to uh, 2010, six years ago. What percent of your practice was PPO in 2010, and, um, and what percent is it um, now, six years later? I would say about 60% uh, was uh, P P PPO back then, and now I would say about, um, I would say about 50% is uh, PPO and... Um, so you've, got, you've gone I mean, for... 50% 50 is fee for service and the rest is, uh, I would say, you know, it's close, like, and there's a small fraction of, uh, you know, patients uh, who has, you know, I take some, um, uh, like, you know, small insurances, like some locals. But you said in 2010 you were 60% PPO? Yeah. And what percent in 2016? No, right, right now I do take PPOs. Right, but, but what I'm percent? Out I'm out of network. Oh, okay. Nice. You're out of network. So, so I'm out of network. Exactly. That's what I meant. So, so the so the main difference is in 2010 you were 60 percent PPO in network, which means you had to accept their fees. Exactly. And now in 2016, um, you're still um, over half PPO, but you're out of network, so your fees are higher. So thus, your profit margin is probably higher. Yes, sir. Now, did you lose how much volume? What percent of your PPO practice did? What percent of the patients did you lose by going out of network? I would say thirty percent. So one in three. So so one in three were buying on uh, volume price, and two thirds stayed because they were on um, staying with you for value. Yep, exactly. And and that that's an amazing feat that you could keep um, because most experts believe that the United States one half of the three hundred thirty million buy on volume, price, insurance, and one half buy on value. And you were able to keep uh, more than half, two thirds. Do you think that was because of the demographics of Old Bridge, New Jersey? Is it a richer area? Or do you just think it was because you uh, had developed so much more skills getting your FAGD, your MAGD and all, and your diplomats and all that? I think certainly our credentials contribute to it and our expertise contribute to things. But it's a blue collar neighborhood, and uh, you know people's my mindset has dif changed and differed uh, from the past 30 years, from where it used to be fee for service to insurance based uh, business these days. So unless we change, we take the first step and uh, change the mindset of the public. You know people will go out and uh, spend uh, 1.2 million dollars on a Lamborghini or a mansion, but you know dentistry is last on their mind. Where they want to spend your, uh, you know, spend their hard-earned uh, dollars. Well, you know, one, one, my, my biggest critique on dentistry is uh, two things. One, you remember, uh, you're old enough to remember, 19 years ago when Reader's Digest uh, yes. sent a journalist out with a set of study models and X-rays and sent him to 50 different dentists and literally got 50 different treatment plans, and um, and that is just uh, um, crazy in and of itself. And do you, do you still think that exists today, that um, if you went around New Jersey with a, a patient and had a patient go in and get 50 different uh, exams and treatment plans, do, do you think it'd be 50 different treatment plans? Of course, because everybody's expertise is different. Uh, like, for example, say we come out of dental school, on one hand, let's take one dentist who uh, practices dentistry, got out of school, started practicing dent dentistry back then, say 20 years. Then other dentists who had uh, taken continuing education, updated his skills, and he's also practicing the same amount of, uh, you know. But the skills, the skill sets differ, the mindset of the dentist differs, the business aspect of things differs. So there's a lot of variables within the dentistry community. And say you're practicing in one particular small community, you, you ask 10 dentists, uh, the same guy goes over and, you know, get 10 different treatment plans, and that's the norm. And that's basically what's happening. So if on an ethical standpoint, if you look at it, you know, you see a lot of things happening around, uh, you know, since the recession, 
and I've seen a lot of things happen and people come to me with complications, you know, all those things. So, you know, it's it's how we put ourselves and portray ourselves to patients and uh, that's the way we can flourish in business. And, uh, you know, everybody has different views and, you know, we do what is right uh, for our practice and uh, for our community. You know, I said there were um, two pet peeves in um, of mine industry. One was, um, well, I probably have <laughs> more than that, but um, one was that there's no standard product. I mean, like when you're making uh, a Ford 150 pickup truck for, you know, um, they all come out the same. Um, these dental, I, I never understood how you could have a chain of 1500 dental offices when you had a thousand dentists that all had a different treatment plan. So that, that's tough. The other thing that I tell these young kids before they jump on lowering their prices and race to the bottom, that I've seen no evidence of any business model, any dentist, no one keeps their patients. I mean, if there's 52 weeks in a year and you only work, you get two weeks vacation. So you work 50 weeks and the average, average, average patients can be seen twice a year. That means that means you're going to see, um, you know, them twice over two 25 week periods. And if you look at the hygiene departments, I mean, the average dental office has one hygienist four days a week, uh, eight hours a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's 32 hours times 25 weeks. She could only service 800 people twice a year. And if the average dentist gets 25 new patients a month, that means every two and a half years you would add another hygienist Monday, That's Tuesday, it. Wednesday, Thursday. Yet every time I see a dentist who's worked 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, they still have the same uh, hygiene capacity that they started with. So that means every time you put a new patient on six month recall, an old patient had to fall off. So, it, so why are people worried about Aspen and Heartland and Pacific when they have lost their own patients their entire life? I mean, no one keeps patients for life. How do, how do you, and, and they always talk about spending 3% of, of collections on advertising to get new patients, but you can never get them to spend 3% on anything that has to do with patient loyalty. How do, how do you think you can keep customers coming back as opposed to just following the next group on and going to the next, you know, $50 cleaning exam and x-ray coupon? How do, how do you keep customers coming back for life? See, with the social sites where they give deals, mainly it's basically it's a one-night stand, sort of. So, you know, in my word, uh, it's basically one word, which is quality. You know, if you do a, qu a quality work and people are happy with it, they'll refer your family and friends, and word of mouth is what goes. Because on the in the short term, the pricing is what stays in the mind. But in the long term, quality is what stays in the mind of the patient. And that's how they refer patients and friends. I mean, as uh, family and friends, basically. And what, what skill, what are you doing in your office? I mean, what are you referring out? What are you doing yourself? What do you like to do on your patients? You know, I, I, I tend to do most of the stuff. I don't do implants, but I restore them. So, but I have, uh, you know, I, I look at uh, CAT CAM and, you know, this all these uh, new technologies coming out, CAT scan and, you know, all those things. Uh, iCAT, you know, all those things. So, you know, technology is good, but, you know, if you are not comfortable, don't do it. That's how I look at it. You know, if you have a complication, you know, you either uh, it's better to be forewarned rather than, you know, get into trouble and then you figure out what you want to do with it. So if you're comfortable with it, do what we are comfortable with and, uh, you know, refer out the rest. That's what I do. And, and so what are you doing? No, I do basically all phases of general dentistry, you know, endodontics, periodontics, prosthodontics. Uh, you name it, everything else I do, except other than uh, placement of implants. Do you think kids should join the ADA and the AGD? Or so some people think the AGD is, is more tailored to general dentists. Some people think you should join both. Some people think the ADA is too weighted towards the nine specialties. Um, do, do you think the ADA is in competition with the AGD or are most of your AGD friends also members of the ADA? A small fraction of uh, my board members, they're basically members of the ADA. So, you know, I was once a part of ADA and for me, I didn't, I couldn't see any value to myself or my practice being a member. So, you know, AGD for me, it basically is geared more towards general dentist. So, you know, I, I learned a lot from um, attending the hands-on courses and the AIM course and, you know, all those things. So basically, 
I feel that uh, ADA didn't serve my the purpose of the general dentist, and from what I understand, it mainly serves the purpose of all the specialists. Uh, I mean, specialists of uh, you know, uh, who are uh, serving dentistry. So, what do you think of uh, in your journey in America on dentistry, the rise of corporate dentistry? They now say there's 35 corporate chains that have more than 50 locations and they're employing about 12 to 14 percent of the dentists. What, what kind of effect do you think that has on dentistry? I think uh, it could be like the Walmart of dentistry. So basically you have a corporate dentistry coming in. They are open uh, longer hours. They have all the specialists on hand, which is uh, not available to a uh, localized, uh, I mean, you know, a general dentist who is by himself or herself. So I think in the long term, you know, they they may benefit, but on the short term or the long term, you know, how, it depends on how you look at it. You know, they may lose out on it because the quality is going to be compromised. And like you said, there's a lot of dentists who are getting into corporate dentistry right out of dental school due to the severe uh, heavy debt load. So, you know, it might help them on a profit standpoint, but on a quality standpoint, you know, they might be facing a lot of lawsuits or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I hear a lot of things happening with corporate dentistry and, you know, good and bad. So what um, do you what do you do you recommend getting your FAGD on like a fast track program? Do you want to explain the fast track? Do you do you have I, that in New Jersey or? No, there is something called AIM and basically, you know, you pay an X amount of dollars and it covers uh, certain courses, you know, which is given during a couple of years, during the course of uh, a duration of a couple of years. So, you know, I didn't go through the fast track. You know, I took my time. I, I picked the courses, what I like to see. And on the AGD website, if you look at it, there is, uh, you know, there are the list of courses. You know, I've traveled to Minnesota. I've traveled to Hawaii on uh, taking different courses. So I picked the courses, what is geared to my requirement and what I need is what I, and, and what I can apply in the day-to-day -day practice of dentistry. And those are the courses I picked. It's a little sort of expensive, but uh, you know, I want to do what I like to do and learn what I like to do. And you know, learn from things, keep the mind open and you know, learn things from different people and you know, you learn from different courses. In your, um, you, you've been practicing for uh, three decades. Um, what, is your, what is your view of the health of the average dentist after doing dentistry for 30 years? Um, do you think, uh, compared to other professions, if you'd have been a physician, a lawyer, an engineer, a software programmer, do you think dentists are healthy and, and what, what advice would you give on health? Yeah, based on the consensus, uh, you know, dentists have a lot of problems, right from our posture to uh, the mindset to perfectionism, you know, accuracy, you know, all those mindset which basically has uh, affected a lot of uh, people. And I lost one of my friends who uh, recently who had some issues. And, you know, patients- Did he, did he take his own life? Uh, sort of, yes. Yeah. So basically you see a lot of damage in their own cocoon, basically, you know, we are not, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, socially, I don't, I don't think Danish are that, uh, you know, out, outgoing. So a lot of people, they work within their cocoons, go home and then pursue the same thing the next day. So basically, you know, uh, and the uh, business aspect of dentistry is not as profitable as how it used to be many decades back uh, as how the experience by the previous generation of dentists. So that has put a stress load on, um, you know, a, a dentist uh, family life and uh, their lifestyle. Uh, so I think a lot of people have back aches, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, what is that, the carpal tunnel and, you know, other health issues, you know, including obesity, you name it. So, you know, we, our body is not designed to sit in one place and do the work. You're supposed to be moving hard work and then you eat and then you burn out the fat, basically. So in today's world, we are basically cocooning ourselves within our own practices, having less of a physical work. And ultimately, we consume more of junk what we get from the supermarkets because that's the fastest way, heat and eat it. So in my view, on a long term, we are destroying our own health for the sake of uh, so-called business. So, you know, I think both uh, health and uh, wealth goes hands in hand in hand. So it's how we balance our life is what makes the difference. Now, do you think uh, 
your hobbies have been a big part of your uh, um, keeping mental health? I mean, uh, you know, not just doing dentistry all the time. Do you, do you think your artistic side has been uh, one of your secrets to uh, success and mental health? You know, everybody has some, uh, you know, something what they like to do as a hobby. You know, some like golfing, some like playing cricket, some play like playing, uh, you know, ping pongs, whatever. I mean, you know, so everybody has their own hobby. Some like traveling. I love traveling. So, you know, everybody has their own views on what relaxation is. Some people like just meditation or yoga. But, you know, for me, this has contributed a lot into, uh, you know, sort of uh, relaxation and, you know, say uh, over the weekend, you know, this long weekend, I'll be doing some paintings myself and, you know, I do sculpting, you know, all those things. So, it, in my view, it helps me a lot. And I would suggest everybody pick up a hobby and do what they like to do, not just because somebody's golfing. You know, we need to be a golfer too. So that's how I look at it. You know, when I started in '87, uh, you know, I kept getting asked out to golf with Dennis, and uh, they—if uh, you talk about dentistry, they got all mad, which I didn't understand. And that's what I want to talk about. And they seem so stressed. And the, the the defining moment for me is, you know, they they'd cuss, they'd stress. That I remember, I'll never forget one time at the 18th hole, one of the dentists missed the shot and threw his golf clubs in the fa in the lake in the fountain and I just thought you know this isn't even cool it's not even fun I mean these bunch of crazy people out here you know I, I've already got enough stress with you know doing dentistry insurance business employees patients I, I don't need four hours of a bunch of psychos you know screaming yelling and cursing in golf uh, so I, I, I pass that one up I, I <laughs> you know cheers to anyone who has uh, golf with uh, people who actually uh, treat it as a hobby now are you sitting in front of it did you paint the painting behind you yeah, that's mine, yes. Wow, that is amazing. How large is that? Uh, it's about, I would say, six feet by four feet. If you're listening <laughs> to this on iTunes, you, I really wish you would subscribe to us on YouTube. Go to uh, youtube.com forward slash Dentaltown Magazine, but you got to go to YouTube or on Dentaltown to see this painting. Just describe the painting that it's behind you. Is is that is yeah. that a make believe setting or is that an actual? No, it's not a make believe. It's a real setting. Uh, actually, I'd gone to Malaga, Spain, uh, back uh, two years back, and last year I was in Norway. I, I, you know, I like take for, taking photographs. You know, I, I, I do a lot of things like that. So this is a uh, castle in Malaga, and I took this photograph uh, from this is the exact scenario how it looked like, and I came came back home, and I did the painting over a two week period. Now, what, what is it on? Are you in your dental office? Are you in your home? Are you in your office? Uh, th this is in my office, but as soon as you enter my office, this is what you see. It's a, it's a huge painting, and it's it's on my available on my website, basically. It's uh, www.drselvandds.com. And, uh, you know, I have all my portfolio. It's, it's a sample portfolio is on that. Very, very nice. Uh, Thank you. That, that is very nice. So now, do you use photography in your patients? Um, is yes, that, I. And when, when do you use photography in your pa in your dental office? Well, usually pre-op, post-op. Not in all cases, but if I feel that any case is interesting, you know, I have an icon with a you know ring flash, and you know, I have two other icons for my auto photography, including zoom and all those stuff. So close-up lens is what I use for the icon, and uh, you know, the ring flash uh, serves the purpose, and you know, like things, techniques change, so I have to keep up with the technology of how the cameras change and how they have evolved over the last, uh, what, 20, 25 years. I think it's amazing. I mean, when I was a kid, when I was 10 years old, only rich people had cameras. Even exactly. if you had a camera, you couldn't afford the film. Even if you could buy the 12-pack of film and take the pictures, you couldn't afford to get it developed. Of and course. now these kids have a 1,000 photos on their iPhone and are texting them all over and then storing them for free in the cloud if they're on Facebook, Google+, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter. I mean, it's just amazing. It really, it really grinds my gears when you hear... And they share it to millions for free, basically. Yeah, yeah and it grinds my gears when you hear these, uh, these people on TV saying, you know, the American people don't make any more money today than they did 15 years ago. God, dude, when we were little, you might have afforded five or six albums. Exactly. And, and, and you might have a shoebox of 25 pictures. And now, yep. you know, these kids have a thousand phones on their iPhones. They can listen to songs on YouTube uh, infinitely. Um, so, you know, if you kids are out there listening, one of the biggest differences I see, you know, when you come out of school, you got to learn how to do a, a cleaning, a filling, an exam, a root canal. 
And if you, by the time you're 50 years old and you got your FAGD and your MAGD, you're doing comprehensive exams. So the reason the older dentists do so much more dentistry is because they see so much more dentistry. And they're not just going in there and looking to see, you know, at first if you have any cavities and that's your whole exam. Then, then you get a little older and you see if there's any broken teeth that need a crown. You start seeing occlusion and TMJ and you start seeing all these things come together. And that's why when a 50 year old dentist sees one new patient, their average treatment plan might be over, you know, um, a thousand. Whereas these kids will do an exam and their average exam is uh, actually the average exam in the United States is $388. If you just divide out the revenue by the new patients. So it's $388, but um, moving towards a comprehensive exam, what, what advice would you give them from going from an x-ray of an exam at a dental school where it's four bite rings and they're just looking for decay versus your exam? What, what is your new patient exam like? See, if you go by what the insurance companies or carriers are telling the you know younger generation to do, is if you go by limited amounts, your mind is narrowed. So say you're allowed to take only four bite wings or four PAs uh, per six months or whatever, and you don't have a full series, say a patient comes from the other dentist and ha already had an FMS, they're not going to pay for another FMS, and the patient does not want to pay for that either. Now, you are limited to taking, either you take four bite wings, four PAs, or you send the patient home. So you are basically, your hands are tied behind your back. Now, if you want to have an entire picture, you know, if you don't have the entire picture in front of you, you're basically limiting yourself, like taking an ICAT and you take a whole face or a narrow down to just the arches, your, your, your focus is only limited to that particular area. So your mindset had to be kept open. If you don't have a full series, you cannot do the best what you can. You can only do what you see. And like Dr. Howard said, you know, you have to start looking for things. If you don't look for things, you're not going to see pathology in it. You know, you have to look for it. You have to be having a trained eye for it. And that all comes at, comes down to expertise. You know, millennials, millennials are much smarter than all of us. You know, they have all the technology, the internet, you name it. You know, if you got to use the technology to your benefit. You know, we, we are loaded with Facebook every second you go to a meeting, you know, everybody's on their phone. Nobody converses. The communication skills have gone away. And if you don't communicate, you know, that's the end of the line. You know, you can actually call your dentist next door or, you know, take him out to lunch or something, you know, have a conversation about an interesting case. You know, that's, you know, the open communication is lost in today's era. You know, you go to a pay, you go to a soccer field. You have 10, 10 kids uh, lining up for the, the game, and if you look at all the kids, you know, during a break, they basically run up to their phones. They don't talk to each other, and this is what is lacking in today's technology. And I think communication skills will be dead in the next 10 years if we pursue it. And this is what is happening in high schools. You see it all around. You go to the mall. You, everybody's on their phone. I mean, who sees face to face to face? Nobody. Eye to eye communication the body language, the contact, everything is gone. I mean, you know, we have to get things back in track. So you want to, have, you have an interesting case, talk to your colleague or, you know, AGD has a mentorship program. If you're interested in uh, learning something about it, you can contact me or contact the academy. And uh, we can, uh, you know, guide you to someone who, you know, who, who can uh, share their views and thoughts and experiences with you. How do they contact you or the academy? You, or your website, email, they, phone? They can go to the njagd.org or, uh, you know, they can contact me directly through my website, which is uh, DDS.com. That's D-R-S-E-L-V-A-N-D-D-S.com. And uh, you have all the information there. You can email me anytime, 24 by 7. And what's your email? Uh, D-R-S-E-L-V-A-N S E L V A N at drselvan.com. Dot com. Okay, so it's dr, just Selvin. dr Selvin. Yeah, dr s e l v a n at dr s e l v a n dot com. Okay, that that is amazing. And and um, what do you think um, if they went to the AGD website? What what do you think they should uh, start f with first? Do you think they should do the mentorship program or what? What do you think? If if you are a member, you should be utilizing the resources. That's what you're paying for. And uh, we, and uh, you know, at the board, we basically try to create uh, CE courses which are PACE approved 
uh, to your needs because if you don't know what you need or what you want you know there's no way of us uh, reading your mind so you can email us let us know what you like what topics you like what days of the month you like so there are a lot of variables you know thanksgiving time or christmas time nobody wants to take a course the same thing with the summer so unless you tell us and give us a feedback on what you like and which dates you which dates or years of the month which you i mean which uh, month uh, you prefer courses or which time of the year you know we could cater to your needs and how much is it for them to join dental uh I think grads. there's a national membership fee. Uh, I think the agd.org, I think they are the national uh, website. So, you know, they have a constituent uh, dues as well as a national dues and they collect it. You know, we don't collect it at our constituent uh, uh, for New Jersey. Very good. So what what else, what other advice would you uh, like to give the kids? I only got you for a few more minutes. Anything else on your mind or anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I was thinking uh, basically, uh, you know, people, the millennials, uh, especially the new Danish who are coming out with school, they are loaded with debt. So now, you know, the system is set up where, uh, you know, we are we are all uh, supposed to work till, our, till we die. We need to enjoy life. You know, life is meant to be enjoyed. So, you know, you need to travel, you need to communicate, keep things open, keep an open mind and keep moving on with life. And if you don't, you know, life is too short. Before you know it, it's time to go. So that's what happens. So, you know, learn the best you can. Keep everybody happy. Be happy yourself. You know, enjoy the job, what you do. And learn as much as you can, which will benefit you and your family for long term. Well, I don't think you can add anything to that. Any That was amazing. Anything else you want to say? Uh, that's about it, sir. I think, uh, yeah, just take care of the health, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> so, um, you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, but I can't stop myself from asking uh, is uh, you, you you have one of the most famous governors in America, Chris Christie. He's probably probably one of the only governors that everybody in America knows the name. How How is it living in his backyard? Looks like he's doing good. <laughs> he's doing good? And yep. tr and Trump um, had a casino in your state, and now he's uh he's shutting down. I heard the Trump Taj Mahal is shutting down. That's what I heard. I think today or uh, tomorrow. I don't know over the weekend. Oh, it's shutting down right now. Yep, that's what I heard. So it failed then. Yep, I think a lot of casinos have uh, closed down over the years, and I think they have too much competition. You know, Philadelphia has a certain casino, upstate New York, Mohegan Sun. You know, the whole thing. So there's a whole bunch of casinos popping up around, and uh, you know I think uh, Poconos has one. So it's like uh, really? it's all Poconos around. Poconos has casinos now. Yep, they have it. They have it for the past couple of years. They have one. Huh, that's one of my favorite places to go is the Poconos. Yep, I think it's by Camelback. I think it's around that area. Huh, that is amazing. Yeah, there's a uh, casinos uh six exactly six miles from my house. There's a major casino, and what's yep. the most amazing thing is when I go out on my. 5 a.m. Uh, bike ride or run, uh, I run by it, and I mean, even at 5:30 in the morning, the parking lot is completely filled. In fact, one of my friends uh, was on a bike ride, and he was almost back home at 9 o'clock, and someone uh, um, coming back from the casino drunk drove over him and killed him um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, coming home completely. Uh, intoxicated from a casino it's an amazing business a casino can you imagine opening up a building where people just come in and throw their money away <laughs> it's open 24 by 7 <laughs> yeah that is amazing I was in New mexico a couple of months back uh, for a conference and uh, you know they have casinos there and uh, you know basically the local natives they are they're the ones who are the employees over there and it's out of nowhere basically and still it's crowded like you said so why did you get the uh, lifelong service and recognition by the Academy of General Dentistry in Boston uh, this past July? What did you do to deserve that? That that is an amazing accomplishment. Well, you got to be a master for that, and uh, basically, I'm doing it for myself, and uh, it's not uh, for an accolade or whatever, you know. So I'm doing it for myself and for my self improvement. You know, I, I read a lot of uh, books. I read a lot of book on finance, self improvement, astronomy. You know, astronomy, you know, I, I learn a lot of things and I try to keep my eyes open. You know, I have a telescope in my house, which I use for deep space photographs and, you know, learning about other comets and, you know, other uh, planetary life forms. And if you notice the news, you have seen that in Russia, they had uh, listened to some radio waves, you know, using radio telescopes. 
to uh, they have got some signal from emitting from some far off galaxy and it's very interesting you know you got to keep your minds open and you know you, you learn a lot of things and life you know learning never ends basically yeah i love to learn i've never been a big fan of fiction i would always rather read a real book uh than um uh, some fiction uh, nothing nothing wrong with fiction but uh yeah there's just sci learning science is so much fun well dr selvin thank you so much for spending an hour with me today on a Friday on uh, and um, thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry all you've done for New Jersey the AGD you're an amazing man and thank you for sharing all your words of advice uh, with all my uh, people listening to the show that are under 30 and just walked out of school and got to hear your words of wisdom thank you so thank you very much and have a great weekend oh a labor great Labor Day weekend it's a three-day weekend yes, yes yeah okay we'll have a rocking great Labor Day weekend